Hey everybody, and welcome again to the Board Game Mechanics. I'm Katie, and with me as always is... Hey guys, what's going on? It is Jason. Alright, um, after maybe some awkward conversations last week, we're back again. We didn't get censored or anything, so that's a plus. Yeah, I think it was close. If the FCC would have heard it, we would have probably gotten canceled. Not enough people reported us, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> for ex- explicit content yeah that's true we run a family show we we kept it pretty clean i'd like to think just i know some of you can't handle my ridiculously sexy voice so you know whatever happens <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility so uh i think this week we're gonna veer away from that kind of content and maybe come around it from the other side oh yeah <laughs> You're the one. You're the one that's going to get blocked. <laughs> I'll just bleep myself. It's fine. I'm going to talk about some news. Because you're obviously already raring to go. All right. So, again, Kickstarter has... There's tons of really interesting stuff out there. Like, I have found some really cool stuff while I've been browsing Kickstarter. And I've got stuff lined up for weeks. So... Tonight, I want to start off talking about a game that I don't know if it's going to fund. I kind of hope it does. Um, it's called Ghost Hunting the Card Game. And so what I what I like about this game is I think that it's a s- senior in college's final project. Um, at least I'm assuming it is because uh, the person that developed a game is studying in Singapore. And so I'm not sure of exactly what level of education that he is. But he is doing this as his senior project. Um, And it's actually um, themed about the ghost culture of Southeast Asia, which I thought was super cool. And um, it's not really, I guess, too thematic in that, like the ghosts that appear are the ones that you will see in Southeast Asian culture. But it seems like a pretty basic game. Um, It can play, it's a card game. It can play three to seven people. And you're really just collecting as many ghosts as you need to, to hit like a, I think a fear amount of 12. So you're playing cards to capture ghosts. Um, There are also cards that like can help power up your ghosts to make them scarier. So you get more, generate more fear and other cards you can play on other people's ghosts that makes them like less scary. Um, So their fear rating goes down for them. It seems really cute. Um, It's $30 and there's 17 days left. So I, I feel like, $30 is kind of a lot for a card game, but the artwork is super adorable, and it seems like it would be really fun. Um, So that's Ghost Hunting the Card Game, 17 days left on Kickstarter, and 30 bucks for the base pledge. Check it out. Yeah, the artwork is cute, and the box is like a little ghost, which is cute too. But yeah, 30 bucks that's way too much. I want the students to succeed, so I feel kind of bad that I don't want to back it, but maybe other people will. Maybe that price point doesn't bother you. Yeah, go for it. Money bags. Right, yeah. So my second game I want to talk about tonight is also another card game. And I also think it's overpriced, (laughs) which I feel terrible about because it's a cool theme. This game is called Saucy Grannies. Yes, grannies, like your grandma, your noni, your nana. (laughs) Uh, Please tell me this is about cooking. It is. (laughs) Okay, good. good. It's totally. I thought we were going to get into that explicit territory again. No. No, I did not look up any of those games. Um, This is where you pick a grandma to be, and they're like grandmas of all nationalities, which I think is really super cool. I love that about this game. And you basically are a granny entering into a cook-off with other grannies to make like the best (laughs) sauces, which is so hilarious. Yeah, So then, (laughs) like any granny, you force your family to help you and like go out to the market to get you the ingredients you need. Um, There's recipe cards and objectives to do. Um, You can like, I'm not sure all the gameplay, but you're duking it out with other people for the ingredients, get the ingredients you need um, to complete certain recipes in order to get the most points in order to win the cook off. Um, It's for two to six players. There's like tons of cards in this because you have like a whole, when you pick a granny and I think there are like almost 20 grannies to choose from and they also have player powers, which is really cool. Then you get like a whole family, like five to six family members that you can use in like a worker placement type thing, but it's all card based. 
and there's like a ton of different ingredients like and you're making really cool sauces from all different nationalities which I think is awesome because I'm such a huge fan of cooking shows um just today I was watching an Anthony Bourdain show rest in peace Tony um and he, I watched him. I watched a lot of TV today. Uh, he was traveling to Singapore. He was in London. Uh, he was in Amsterdam, uh, in Miami. Just all these and seeing all these different types of food, and like so many people learn say they learn to cook from their grandma. And so I think this was really cool about this game is it brings that kind of relationship to like a fun, a fun like card game. Um, there's eleven days left on the Kickstarter and it's $45 for uh just That's a lot. Yeah, for the game. It's a lot, but the artwork is is really adorable. Um you def I, it's definitely worth like checking out um because it's really cute and the the, the idea and the theme is cool. Like ugh, I just wish it weren't that much. I I'm not quite sure why it's that much. To be honest, like it comes in a really great box. The artwork is really awesome. It's probably the artwork. Yeah, it looks, it almost looks like the artwork from Village Pillage or something like that. It kind of does. It has this like cartoony, but also realistic at the same time. Yeah, and I really love that. Yeah. Um, it looks really nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's 45 bucks. <laughs> Yeah, I'm out. I know, and that's what makes me really sad because I'm like, oh my gosh, this would be a really fun, like, light kind of card game you could play with people. That whole idea, again, the theme of, you know, grandmas making recipes together, like, that's awesome. Um, this is actually out of Singapore, which has some really amazing um, food there, and like the ethnic, there's so many different ethnicities that have like moved in in Singapore essentially that there is every kind of food cuisine there um and so like I feel like this is so much the like it's like so authentic but it is $45 for the game man it looks so good though yeah <sighs> uh, they'll learn they'll bring it down if it fails they'll bring it down I don't think it's failed I think it's already funded uh, I don't think so yet okay I just looked at it maybe not it is um, like over halfway funded. Okay. And there's 11 days left, so maybe it won't be funded. And if they come back with a lower price point, I would be so tempted to get this because I, I think it looks like fun gameplay and I love, I, I love a good, interesting theme. Like cooking has kind of been done before, but the idea of making it about your abuela or your noni, you know, I love that. Yeah, it is a cool theme for sure. So... That's Saucy Granny. It's 11 days left on Kickstarter. 45 bucks. Uh, check it out. If you just have like money lying around, like you're swimming in it or something, um, there's like a two copy one. You can buy one for yourself. Send one to me. You know, I I'd be happy. I'd be happy to do that for you. Take it off your hands. <laughs> yep. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is not technically like a game per se as far as a board game. But it is in the tabletop RPG arena, which I like to talk about every now and again, because we hardly talk about that on the podcast. And that's something that I enjoy. And I think a lot of our audience members do, too. So if you do like RPGs, if you play D&D, please comment, hit us up, um, tell us on the Facebook group, The Riveted, because I think Jason needs to know that there's a big, a bigger representation out there of players than just me. But no, I'm, I'm doing all right. No. Spam him. Okay, so I want to talk about, it's called uh, Dragon Stew. And what it is, it's actually, I don't want to say it's a book necessarily, but really it's a supplemental to 5e um, for Dungeons and Dragons. And it's about cooking, which I think is so cool. So, like, there's, you can incorporate rules, like, as, like, a supplement to your, whatever your main campaign is, um, like, cooking rules. So, let's say you kill a beast and then you can have your character decide to cook it. And it has all the ways to figure out, like, if you cook this beast in this way, would it give you your party or you this kind of benefit if you ate it? Or if you gave it to somebody else, which I think is really interesting. Because then it's like, okay, it's not just healing potions. What if I am able to cook and then create healing food? Which I think is a really interesting take. 
um, on your role playing. And I think that that is a cool idea. You can also create these dessert familiars, like literally like familiars that like you can summon in combat or even out that are made of like pastry or whatever desserts and they can give you benefits um like to a battle or outside of a battle um there's also like these kind of cooking classes not like actual like you go and sit through a class but there are additions to classes that exist like um a bard kind of subclass that um is like a host so you have different um i don't want to say powers but different buffs for that based for your character based on the, they took the host college. Um, and I th- like for a ranger, if you're like good at hunting beasts to cook there, there's like a class for that. Um, the one that I thought was really cool. I saw it. One of the um, kind of class features is that you like cook with love or something. So you can use your, power to make sure that a healing potion gives the maximum healing points because if you play you know that you roll the die to determine how much you're going to get out of a healing potion but if you're if you have this kind of cooking subclass you can make sure that every like your party members or you can take a healing potion and it actually gives the maximum amount of hit points back to you which i think is is cool and it's like a practical use of something that might just be considered fanciful or backstory filler or downtime filler. Another cool thing about this is the guy who developed this is really interesting. He has like this whole, it's like a cooking hunt and like a cook-off adventure that he's written. So it's like for level five characters. So you, and I'm sure above, but you can get your characters together, uh, get a party, you go out and you go hunting and they like, there's illustrations there's new monsters that are like kind of based around food type things that you're going to fight and then you're going to take once you kill them you you harvest them for ingredients and then you have to make a dish that is going to win this competition for this judge and there's a a whole town there's npcs that you meet he's listed out all these npcs their backstories illustrations of them uh, maps drawn out like there is a ton of stuff included in this and i actually think i saw that with it, the funding it's unlocked like a second kind of cooking adventure which i think is super cool so there's 11 days left on this kickstarter um it's 44 dollars to get the actual physical copy of all this stuff but i think for like 17 you can get all of it um digital which a lot of people prefer i'm old school i will pay the extra money to have it in my hot little hands but um, if you don't, you can get back to Kickstarter at a, a significantly lower level for 17 bucks and get all of this content, which if you have like a real fun, open kind of group that likes developing the story and their characters and doing fun little side stuff and isn't all about like, let's go in and just beat stuff up and move on, which my party seems to be into, <laughs> partially because that's how my DM kind of runs things. He's very old school. Um, this would be a cool thing to check out. So it's called Dragon Stew. 11 days left on Kickstarter, 44 bucks for the physical copy, 17 for the digital. Check it out. Yeah, that saucy granny game sounded really good. Oh my gosh. It's it's cool, honey. It would be so fun. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you think that. Why? Somebody, come support me. You can people can like it. It's just not for me. I, can... I you know how I feel. I've talked about it on the podcast. <sighs> Reading a story, arbitrarily rolling some dice. It's not arbitrarily rolling dice. It is for a purpose. It is. It's arbitrary. No. Arbitrary means there's no purpose. Yeah. I stand by what I said. You obviously uh, have trouble knowing the meaning of words, which is why we should go to our gaming glossary, because you need help. (laughs) Like that transition? You like that? (laughs) Yeah, that's like professional. Good job. Hey, thanks. All right. We're off news and on to our gaming glossary. All right, so this week on the Gaming Glossary, we have two terms. Uh, we have both terms that begin with S's, and that's all the, the lead that I'm going to do, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about mine, and it is spatial manipulation. So this would be a game that involves tiles, probably. 
probably polyominoes. So Uwe Rosenberg, think those games, patchwork. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to take these pieces, you're going to put them in a board, you may have to flip them, uh, upside, not upside down, but you know, top to bottom, left to right. You have to move the piece around to kind of fit it in your board to fill in a gap to try to create like a continuous color or a continuous pattern or something like that. But the whole point of this is you're taking the tile from normal, like face up, and you have to adjust it to put it into spaces, kind of like Tetris. So think Tetris, the board game. That's kind of how spatial manipulation rolls. So I know Katie doesn't really dig these because you try to try to figure out how to put pieces in, not just face up pieces. And that her brain doesn't like that. But mm-hmm. we don't play a ton of these. Mm-mm. We don't have any of them really. Because they're terrible. Maybe, yeah, maybe Small City is a sort of like that, but not really. But yeah, it, if you like Tetris and you want to play a board game version of Tetris, then these are the games for you. So thank Uve and go check out his Indian Summer Cottage Garden patchwork games and you'll have a good time, I guess. The game that made me realize that this was something I could not do was New York 1901. And honestly, that's not the only thing you're doing in that game, much like, you know, patchwork where it really relies on you fitting those things in. But for me, in New York 1901, you have to pick a building to put into your little area of New York. And I would save up and work hard and see this building that I was like, oh, yeah, that building's going to go in there. It's going to maximize my points. I'm going to fill this stuff out. It's going to be great. I buy the building and realize it does not fit in that space because my brain couldn't flip it. I, I couldn't get it right to see what would fit in there. It is so annoying. Like, I understand that a lot of people love this kind of stuff. They love Tetris. And I honestly don't mind Tetris that much, but I I don't play it a ton. Like, I played it a ton, like, when I was in Algebra 2 in high school because I couldn't handle that class and it was boring. And so I just played on my calculator Tetris. But that was, like, my only choice of games on my calculator at the time. Uh, Now, I would have unlimited options. But it... (laughs) I just don't have that spatial manipulation intelligence that a ton of other people do. So I feel bad that I hate on these games so much, but I know that if I play one of these games, I have no chance of winning. None. Because I cannot manipulate those shapes in my head to then be able to play them on the board. Now, if it's a game where I can pick up the tile, move it around, and look to see if it'll fit or not, that's okay because then I can physically judge it. Um, but usually that's giving away kind of the element of strategy in the game when you're basically revealing what piece you're going to pick. So uh, it's just, I I just can't. I just can't. Yeah, I just say people should play Tetris. I mean, it's less fiddly. And once you're done, you just shut it off. I, yeah, but some people really love that. They love like that puzzly kind of aspect of that kind of game. And so you know what? Good on you. I, yeah, I guess. Not me. Yeah. Okay, so I'll talk about my S word for the glossary, and that is social deduction. And social deduction is kind of defined as a game where some or all the players' roles are either complete are completely unknown to some of the players or to all of the players. So they have to use like their logic and their deduction based on kind of whatever the gameplay gives you to figure out what everybody's role is. And then usually the person that like if i know my own role which is you usually do then i have to kind of bluff to keep other players from suspecting my own my role all that stuff that's basically social deduction um i really like this type of game it's one of my favorites because for me part of the social part the biggest part of the deduction is the social aspect and being a true extrovert i really love that So I like watching people, what their faces are saying, what they aren't saying, um, if they hedge around certain questions, what did they look like when they first saw their role even, like all that stuff. I'm always watching, observing, and then seeing their interactions to try and deduce what people's roles are. The most classic of this is Ultimate Werewolf. Uh, When I was growing up in youth group, we played, it was called Mafia, and... Very similar, like you gang up sometimes and say that person is the mafia, that person is the werewolf, and then it's trying to bluff, um, find clues, all that stuff to determine. Um, So Ultimate Werewolf, The Resistance, 
Those are both uh, Shadows Over Camelot, all kind of in that similar realm. Um, I also like Deception, Murder in Hong Kong, which is social deduction, but a little bit different to where, yes, there's a hidden role, but there's also other kinds of deduction and logic to figure out what the murder weapon was and what kind of evidence was left. So it's that added piece that I think really makes it like up above the, the rest of social deduction. And then there's also Bang, which is one of the first games I ever played um, a lot of. And that social deduction in that you are trying to figure out the roles, but you try to figure out the roles by carrying out the goals of your role, if that makes sense. <laughs> so you can learn who the sheriff is by um, – everyone knows who the sheriff is. And so if you see someone repeatedly shooting the sheriff, even though there are other options, you might consider them to be an outlaw. So then who's going to shoot the person shooting the sheriff? Oh, maybe the deputy. So you're putting that in and you're also trying to keep yourself alive, take out the bad guys or the good guys, you know, whichever. And so that's why I love that kind of game. And then um, the li- probably the best one to come out lately is Secret Hitler as far as social deduction, which there's a little bit of like the gameplay there is, you know, taking these, what are they like laws and passing them around and electing chancellors and presidents and seeing where, how people act, what they do, how that plays out in order to determine people's roles. So that is social deduction. Yeah. I like, um, secret Hitler. It's pretty fun. I haven't played werewolf ever. It just doesn't seem interesting to me, but I do like secret Hitler. It's pretty good. It is good. Yes. Yes, it is. Even though you're like a total jerk in it. Yep. But just getting into character. <laughs> no, not always. Yeah, that's true. I guess if you're a liberal, you probably should be right. a jerk. <laughs> then people will get rid of you as a Nazi. So, you know. Yeah. That, not going to work in your favor. Jeremy. Yeah. All right. I'm ready to talk about games I played. I want to talk about some interesting games that I played. And the first one I want to talk about is a game from Smirk and Dagger mm-hmm. called Wooly Whammoth. <laughs> it's a terrible name. It's so terrible. It is a really dumb name. I got to tell yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's really dumb. So what this is, is it's a game where players are playing as a prehistoric tribe or caveman or whatever. And you're trying to kill these mammoth to collect meat to feed your tribe. And you're trying to be the first person, first player to get six meat. And the way you're doing that is everybody has the same eight cards in their hand. You're going to simultaneously pick a card. You're going to reveal. And it's going to tell you how far on this little board you have in front of you that you need to move towards the mammoth. If you can push the mammoth off, you'll kill it and you get the meat. Or if you can end in one of the two final spaces in front of the mammoth, that'll kill it and you'll get the meat. So the trick here is you add everybody's movement together and everybody moves that far. So there's some cards that move people negatives. There's some cards that move you a whole pile of movements and there's sometimes where someone will play a charge card which is going to make the mammoth charge towards you and if you don't play a certain card and the mammoth hits mammoth hits you you die when all your tribe members die you're out of the game right so there is some player elimination but it's a pretty fast game so it's not really that that big of a deal Uh, everybody also has their own player power or tribe power i guess Mm -hmm. that you can use once for every character that you have that's alive and when you die it reactivates so you can use it again. Uh, there's usually two different kinds of options. There's like a movement option and then like some other special option. But yeah, if you like simultaneous action selection and you like games that kind of make you feel like you're pushing your luck, then this is a game that you need to try. I know it's not push your luck because usually in push your luck, you can decide how far you want to keep going or when you want to stop. But in this, you're just flipping a card and then you're moving. So it's kind of like a flip and move sort of, but it gives me that same kind of tension as a, a push your luck game. So that's Wooly Whammoth. And I dig it. Well, and that's, it's, it's push your luck in that you are choosing from your cards. So it's like, okay, well, I want, you have cards that sometimes can let you stay still. And you're saying, okay, I want to stay still because I don't want to fall into this tar pit or I don't want to run off the edge. But you also are like, someone can play a charge where the, the man that charges towards you. So it is in that aspect, push your luck, like, okay, do I just go for it and put a big number out so I rush towards this mammoth? Or is it going to have me flinging off the ki- cliff and killing my people? You know, is that always a bad thing? Like, I, I really actually enjoyed it. I thought it was really fun. It is fun, yeah. I mean, 
like I mentioned before, if it feels like push your luck, it automatically gets a six in my book. So this is a, uh, it feels like that. So it gets a six at least. Yeah. I enjoyed this <laughs> a lot. I've never, I've never ever heard of it before. Me either. But it it was super fun. Yeah. I liked it too, which I was, I was unsure. Yeah. It's just a silly, a silly game. Yeah. But I thought, it, I thought it was really like sometimes those silly games aren't, it's like, okay, it's silly, but there was enough game to this that I I really felt like I enjoyed a lot of the strategy to it. Like I, yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Yeah, you had to decide when you wanted to use your player power and all that. Yeah, there was decent decisions for sure. Yeah, it's a good game. Check it out. My game uh, that I want to talk about is nothing like that at all. <laughs> um, it is called Role Player, and I'm sure we've talked about it before. And I, I've played this several times, and I... You're really hitting the D&D theme hard this week. I, I am. I got to get it out there, man. Need support. It's rough. I want to make sure all pe- all peoples are represented. Um, but role player, if you haven't played it, it came out around the time when Sagrada and Azul kind of came out where you're filling, mostly it's more like Sagrada, but you're filling up a board with things that you're collecting. In Sagrada, it's dice just like role player. But what I love about role player is that it adds that D and D theme on it to where I'm rolling stats for a character. Now we do not have any of the expansions, and I really want them like bad, um, but we just haven't gotten them yet. And even without them, though, I think role player is so fun because you're making that choice of okay, I have this character, and I want to hit these certain goals as far as numbers for all the, the, their different stats, strength, charisma. Um, constitution, intelligence, dexterity, and wisdom. And some, you choose your race. And so that gives you like sometimes a boon or a negative to some of those characteristics. And so then it's like, okay, what? And then you get a card that tells you like, okay, you need to have 16 or 17 as your strength. You need to have, you know, 14 plus as your wisdom, whatever. And you're trying to hit those goals with dice that are randomly rolled each round and then are drafted between you and whoever, whoever else is playing. And then there's a market round, which I think is also cool. Like, it's not like the thing I love about this is, yes, the dice are rolled and it's like, okay, whatever out, out there is out there. And you also need certain colors to put in certain places to get some bonuses. But you each stat row has its own um, special ability to allow you to manipulate dice. And then you can get cards from the market that will either allow further dice manipulation or allow you to do other things, gain points in other ways, which makes it like, a, I think, a richer, more compelling kind of game for me than Sagrada because of all that. And I mean, I played in a bunch of different player accounts. I feel like it's just as good at two as it is at four, in my opinion. I don't know about you. Uh, Yeah, I like, I mean, as a general rule, I like games at two just because they're faster. But yeah, it plays the same because with more players, you just add more dice out there to draft from and more cards from the market. It just takes a little bit longer. But yeah, I agree. This is like Sagrada, but it has way more gamery stuff going on, like the market row, the traits that you can add, the armor that you can add, just all those columns in your player board giving you special abilities to manipulate the dice just way better than Sagrada. The, I mean, it's not as pretty as Sagrada, but it plays better, in my opinion. Agreed. So yeah, that was role player. I like that game a lot. Yep, that is a good pick. I played that a lot solo, too, which is pretty fun as well. Huh, really? Yep. I didn't know that. Um, so the next game I want to talk about is a game about deep sea diving, and it's from r r Games, and it is called Coralia or Coralia. I don't know how you say it, actually. Coralia. I don't know. Coral, yeah. It's like coral with I-A at the end. So however you, you would interpret that, that's how you can say it. Uh, so what you're doing in this game is it's essentially a dice placement game. So on your turn, you're going to have four dice that you're going to roll. They're going to be four different colors of the six different colors that are on the board. You're going to roll those dice. You're going to put them on this little like holder thing. And then you're going to take one of those dice and you're going to do an action. One of the six actions in one of the six colors. So say I took a yellow die. I could then do one of the six actions in the yellow. So the actions would be if it's a diver, I could put my diver there to try to collect some treasures. If it's a little pearl, I can go there to collect some pearl cards. You're trying to get the most pearls at the end of the game to score points. 
if it's a little octopus, I can put the die there, put my little octopus creature on top of it, and then I get points for every other die in that color coral reef. If it's a, a little fish guy, well, again, it's not a guy, but a little fish um, icon, you can collect some fish cards because you're trying to get different color or different types of fish to score points. So if you can get five different fish, you're going to score like 16 points or something. Or if, if it's a starfish, you can go to the starfish deck and you can get some in-game goals. And if you can't place anything on the coral reef because either that color that you took doesn't have a space open or there's a you just can't use the die, you can put it on the island that's on the board and you can take a card from the island pile, which is going to be some of the other three decks there that are going to help you try to score some points. It's a really simple game. Um, the production is amazing. The dice are really pretty. The board is super colorful and awesome. It doesn't have the greatest rule book. Yeah, I did notice that you guys went over several times. You're like, oh, wait, that's not how we do that. Oh, yeah. that's not how that does it either. Yeah, we played it twice and I still we still played it wrong the second time. So if I played it again the third time, I think I would get it right. So third time's a charm. <laughs> but if you like games that are dice placement, you like really pretty games, you like games that are fairly lightweight and easy, definitely check this one out. It's super fun. Uh, I enjoy it. It's not the best game in the world, but it's 30, 45 minutes. And it's fun. So Coralia, Coralia, Coral IA <laughs> is the second game I played. Yeah, I, I remember when we you got it. It looks so pretty. It reminds me a little bit of Rec Raiders as far as like coloring and stuff goes. Um, yeah, for it's sure. super pretty. And I did not play this one with you. So now that you figured out the rules, I think I wouldn't mind trying it out. Yeah, I'd like to play it at two anyway to see if it plays any differently because you got to like put some dice on the board to like block some spaces mm. and stuff. So to make it a little tighter. So I think that could be cool. cool. So my next game is also a dice game. And if you watched my top 10 video, I talked about this game. And so you definitely, if you haven't watched that video, totally check it out on a YouTube channel. The top 10 of my top 100. Um, but this game is Coinbra. And man, ev- this game's all right. <laughs> yes, it's only Jason's number one game. Um, it is my number two game. Very close for to number one it's just oh it's just so good so in coinbra um you've got these dice that are rolled and so then you draft there's a drafting phase at the beginning so you take those dice and you draft them in order to get draft cards so you use them to then like to mark i don't to bid i guess maybe it's the best way to put it uh yeah sorta yeah sorta to bid um to buy certain cards and there are different colors that give you different bonuses um that correspond to different tracks and cards that give you um either like a one time kind of a instantaneous effect or in game goals or um when you're drafting cards bonuses or Every or when you're in phase E and you take 27 minutes on your turn. Every payout round goals or cards, which I like to effectively work. Um, you draft your cards, you pay for them. Then you move on and you correspond them to these tracks. The tracks are giving you like more currency. There's like a military currency than actual coins currency. They're giving you um, points victory points they're giving you movements around a map which will give you other little bonuses oh there's just lots of super good stuff going on and all these different things give you all these avenues to victory and you can work it however you want for me i choose cards that fire in um round e and that give me bonuses so i draft certain dice that will make those cards fire. But in drafting those dice, I don't use other dice. So I make the cards that I draft work for me. Um, that Yeah, so everybody else's turn is 15 seconds and Katie's is five minutes. But if that makes me win, I don't really see what the problem is there. Just jealousy is what it is. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> don't get jealous. Um, it's, it, it's just one way... Uh, other, other ways are moving around this map and collecting all these bonuses. There's also in-game goals that you're shooting for. I don't collect a lot of actually in-game point cards, which can be like a huge difference. You also want to climb up on these tracks um, because first place gets some really serious good points and second place too. 
This game scales super well. We played this at three, which also has some of like automation to block off certain like bidding spaces. But at two, it scales well. So then at two, you've got more of those. You have to be within a certain like three spaces on a track in order to get second place points. Like it is, it's just such a well designed, super fun game. There's not a ton of player interaction, which some people don't like, but I like it because I can work out my own engine. Well, I basically do build an engine. That's how I work this game. And use it to get me as many points as possible. And I just dig it. That's coin, bruh. Yeah, I like this one quite a bit. And it's funny that you mentioned the not a lot of interaction because just remember that. We'll come back to that in in the feature. Exactly. And I'm, I'm going to call an audible. I'm going to pull Joel and call an audible and talk about another game that we played. Oh, twofer. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, and I want to talk about Timeline Challenge. And I mostly want to talk about it because I won handily the first time I played it. Yeah, I was going to say, not the second time. No, but I was pretty close. Let me That's tell you. True. I was doing poorly. You, I, don't, I couldn't even see you from where I was <laughs> on the track. <laughs> yeah, but Timeline rough. Challenge takes the timeline games, which those are just small little box games that are different themed, like Americana, and I don't, I don't know all the themes. There's sports, there's like Star Wars, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of themes. And you're arranging things in order of when they happened um, in a timeline. So timeline challenge, you take several of how many? Three? Does it matter? What are you talking about? When you make timeline challenge, you have to put in other timeline games to make it work. No, the, the game comes with one set Ooh. of cards. And then we have the Americana version also in there. So you can, it comes with some cards already, so you can play it straight out of the box, or you can add other ones, like if you're really interested in sports, or, um, I don't know, I just know more about U.S. history, so that's in there. Um, I actually like to get some other ones to add to it, to mix it up a little bit, like pop pop culture. I think as long as you're not mixing, like, fantasy or, like, non-real life events in there, I think it would be fun. Yeah. Um, So what Timeline Challenge does is takes putting things into like just the timeline and it mixes them up a little bit. So in almost a trivial pursuit like way, there are these different types of ways to use the timeline cards. And depending on what the color of the spaces that you're on dictates which one you use. So for example, there's one where you try to organize the events that you lay out in order. What came first, second, third, fourth. Um, There's another one where you're trying to guess where on this overarching timeline these events happened. So did it happen between 1937 and 1970? Did it happen between the year zero and the year, you know, 300? You're get, kind of getting the ballpark number for where something happened in history. Or you're trying to say, okay, how far apart in history were these two events? How many years were between them? Um, and then there's like little one-on-one challenges for the people that are lagging behind to kind of help them have a catch-up mechanism. Uh, I it's it touches that nerdy part of me that watches Jeopardy every night and and actively bets my money that I don't actually have earned or won on there, and that part of me that also love loves to play Trivial Pursuit and nobody ever wants to play it with me. Like Timeline Challenge is a nice kind of buffer for people in that because you don't always have to know exactly when something took place in order to like do well in the game at least i don't think so yeah i agree i i think this is it's like trivial pursuit but it's fun because you don't have to know the answers exactly so it's like a mixture of like trivial pursuit and like wits and wagers and all of that trivial pursuit is fun but yeah if you know the answers exactly well yeah so that's not me but and i will say in this <laughs> game don't play it at two mm. it is Definitely not fun at two. I played it with Brandon at two, and it was super boring. But at four, it was really yeah, fun. I, I had a good time. So that's my little bonus games playing, and that was Timeline Challenge. So last week, we got you a little hot and bothered with talking about the what our gaming... Oh, yeah. <laughs> what our gaming turn-ons were. And for me... Like I said, it's when I walk into a game store and I look around and I what draws me to a game, what makes me want to pick it up, and and if I read the back, what makes me want to take it home with me? Now, 
This week, we want to cover the opposite, gaming turnoffs. Much like pinky rings and fanny packs, I have some turnoffs for board games. And my list is based on when I walk into an FLGS and I look at a game on a shelf or I pick it up and read the back, what makes me wrinkle my nose, set it back, say, don't ever call me and walk away. So Jason, I'll let you get started with this. And mine are not as shallow as yours. Mine are all based on mechanisms. Oh my gosh. Mine's about actual gameplay. And mine is kind of. I don't judge a game by. I don't. I don't judge a game by the the don't outward don't appearance, give but the away content of its I'm character. T- oh, baloney! <laughs> You're making me sound like I'm some vapid person that I go around like I'm like ooh, I don't want to talk to that guy. Ugh. No, no, no. Yeah, you like just- you Yeah, like you wouldn't get with me if I didn't look like I did. There are several <laughs> right, assets we're, we're, we're that I know a- drew you to me. We're going down a. We're going down a different path <laughs> that is taking us back to last week. <laughs> right, right. Okay? Turnoffs. Gaming turnoffs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it. the first one I want to talk about, the first me- mechanism or gaming thing. It's not that a mechanism. I don't, yeah, that I don't want to see in games because it's awful and it makes me hate life and hate all of these games. And that's roll to resolve combat or just combat in general. So it's kind of a twofer. So if I'm going to, if someone wants me to play a game and I know that I'm going to be moving around on a board and my goal is just to beat you up and eh, probably not going to be something that I want to play. <laughs> or if uh, we're playing cards and the whole point of the card game is to knock me out, knock me from 40 health down to zero. That's a very specific game. <laughs> if you, is it because uh, you hate, if you, it's because you're so <laughs> bad at this that you, it turns like, you off or what? I don't, I don't know. Roll to resolve. I just don't like But the combat in general, I think I'm just over it because of all the magic and stuff that I Mm. played. I think I just played it out. So I've moved on. Like, that's fun. It's cute. It's nice. (laughs) I'm moving on. So my first one's roll to resolve combat slash just combat. (laughs) I feel like this is the nerdy guy who's like, I can't stand cheerleaders. They're terrible people because every cheerleader's turned them down. That's what this <laughs> this is to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you want to use that metaphor, that is fine. I love to. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first one is pretty clear because I've openly discussed this. I am turned off by games that have themes that I hate. And I, in saying this, I realize I have been proved wrong. But I'm talking about I walk into a game store, I see a game, or I pick it up and look at it. If it is a theme I hate, space, or anything that has Robux, robot, Robux. <laughs> Robux. I hate Robux. They're jerks. Shut up. It's the candy talking. Robots or mechs, um, dystopian something. No. Now, have I played other games that take place in space that I enjoy? Maybe. I honestly can't think of one right now. Or if it is in space, it's like so loosely set in space that you don't even notice. Uh, Star Trek Catan, for example. Yeah, I was, I was looking around trying to <laughs> like, find honestly, one. Like, honestly, can't think of anything. I really do hate space. And robots and mechs. I really do. Just because, you know, I don't even know. I don't know why I hate them so much. It's like very cold... It's like that cheerleader that oh, used to try to ask shut out up. on a date. I never asked out a cheerleader, then... you weirdo. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to use your analogy back on you. You can't. It's like... Um, it's like that guy cheerleader that you tried to ask out on a date. Uh, that football player. They all loved me, so no, that doesn't work. <sighs> <laughs> Thanks, try. Um, Katie, the ruiner of all analogies. No, you just have to think of better ones. It's, I just, I feel like they always lead to like cold and personal, like they can't, I don't, I don't know. I I don't know. I just don't like it. I just don't like it. I wish there was a rational reason for it or a logical explanation, but there's not. Because I like, I like space themed, space themed stuff in my life. I am a major Trekkie. I love Star Wars. They are all space themed things. I hate space games. I hate robots and mechs. I don't want them. I don't want to play a game about them. I'm not interested in it. None of it. So if I see that on a cover, if I read the back of a box and that's what it's about, I will immediately go, uh, no, thank you. 
I have a boyfriend and put it down and walk away. I mean, I agree. There's no arguments for me on any of this. Okay. I'm 100% back this. <laughs> I support this. I'm Jason Smith, and I approve this message. <laughs> Do you have a reason why that you hate space and robots and Max? Because I just most of the time space has combat. Well, I don't dig that, and most of the time robots are just I, I don't know I just combat. Don't, not, yeah, not always. Like okay, so to be fair, I did do a video for that yeah. Mechanica game, which is based on robots. But that game is really fun, and the theme is so abstracted out that it's. I don't know, but like, I automatically don't want to play that game because I know it has robot. It's about robots, right? It's, yeah. I mean, I like Roombas. They're cute. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. Yeah. So robots and mechs I don't care about as much. Well, mechs, because that's fighting. Robots I don't care about as much. But space, yeah, I don't normally play those. Hmm. Okay. That's my first one. All right. So my next one, uh, I'm going to bring up Coimbra here. <laughs> it, so my number one game has some stupid player screwage interactivity that is so unnecessary that... It makes me want to knock it down from my number no, one. No, it game. barely does. There's like three cards, maybe. No, no. So, so let me tell you what what oh I'm talking gosh. about. So, in a in a Euro game, they're what we like to call multiplayer solitaire. <laughs> that means I do my thing, you do your thing, you leave me alone, I leave you alone. That's how I want these games to function. If you get in my way when you go to a space, that's fine. So be it. If you take um, a card that I want, so be it. But when there's arbitrary, stupid cards that I take this card and it's going to punish you for absolutely no reason at all. No reason at all. This card doesn't need to be in this game. If that card is in there and you take it and it makes me lose things, that's annoying. That is not necessary. It's stupid. It's dumb. I would take it out of Coimbra. I would rip those cards up. I would burn them. But then I wouldn't have enough cards. So that's the only reason they stay in there. It's awful. It's stupid. And I hate it. Multiplayer solitaire is what it I want. It barely affected the outcome of the game it at all. It doesn't no. matter. I don't like it. I do not like it. Doesn't need to be there. Doesn't need to be there. <sighs> I don't I don't care about this. I mean, I don't want a game based entirely on like beating up each other like Munchkin. I don't I don't like that, but I feel like catch up mechanisms and things like that are kind of built into some of this, and I'm okay with that. All right, let me give you another example. Oh, here we go. Lords of Waterdeep, mandatory quests. You still get points so from them. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, you get four points. What if I was working on a quest that was going to give me 40 points? Well, now i got to take a 36-point loss and waste some of my stupid cubes it's not because you threw a, whole a mandatory point. quest on me. It was that one Same time, thing. and you're still bringing it up. It's that type of stuff. It's unnecessary. It needs to go away. So interactivity, mean interactivity, and player screwage. And Coimbra, I'm talking about you. No, you're not. Like that, to get upset and move Coimbra down in your top 100 because of like three cards is asinine. It was hyperbole. You can bleep that out here. if you want to, but that's exactly what that is. <laughs> asinine's not a bad word. Oh my gosh, you were going to bleep out pissed, but asinine? Okay. Oh, well. there's one bleeping it. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Another thing that really turns me off at a game that sends me running in the opposite direction is when it involves mechanics that I absolutely hate. Um, like worker placement? No. Obviously, I don't hate worker placement. You saw my top 10 video. Uh, lots of worker placement all over that thing. So mechanics I really can't, I really don't like. Area control, dexterity games. And I mentioned before the spatial manipulation, if that's like the main component of the gameplay. I just, and again, I have played games that contain a little bit of this. There are, uh, like, for example, Merlin has a little sideboard that contains some area control element. I hate that board, but I oh, really I like, so fun. you're dumb. I really like the game Merlin. So I, I'm willing to play games with some kind of area control, but if that's all the game's about, absolutely not. No way. If that's the main focus, forget about it. If all I'm doing in this game is flicking crap around, uh, no, that's not a game. We could go play marbles or tiddlywinks for all that matters. No, absolutely not. Again, if I have to move tiles around in my head in order to win, will not do it because I cannot. If I don't have a chance at winning, I'm not playing that game. So, major turn off. If I see it on the box, I will not even try it. 
What about auctions? I don't love auctions, but I play lots of games with auctions that I'm willing to do it. What if a game is only about auctions and making movies? <laughs> That's just a bad game, period. Okay. <laughs> Like, that game just completely sucks. So, Katie hates auction games. All right, moving on. No! I was just saying how Coimbra, I really think that drafting those cards has kind of an auction element. because It, it is an auction, yeah, it is. And for sale. I like for sale. Step off me. I'm just messing. Mm-hmm. Mechanics I hate. All right. So, my last one, probably not even, I don't, this is probably the one that, of all three of these, that bother me the least, but it's just something that. If I know that the game has this, you're going to have to try to convince me to play it, or I'm going to really need to be excited about it. And that is cooperative games. I mm. I don't I don't like them. I, some of them are good. Like, I like Black Orchestra. That one's good. Um, Police Precinct's okay, but I mostly just play it on my phone. So it's just me playing by myself. <laughs> That's kind of how I want to play cooperative games, by myself. I, I don't know. I don't. I just always feel like whenever I play a cooperative game, there's always someone there who wants you to make other decisions for them. And I, I don't want to play your turn. I want to play my turn, and you play your turn. So I just I don't know. I just rather play by myself, win by myself, lose by myself, not as a team. So my last one is cooperative games. Say what you want. That probably says something about my character, my personality. I get yep. it. But <laughs> that's just how I feel. Cooperative games are just not for me. I, I don't dig them. We don't even have a ton of them, really. No, and but I don't. I don't dislike cooperative games. I just like it. You tell me that I'm, you say I'm shallow for my choices. This makes you sound like you're some creeper who wants like a I, hermit who wants to live in the woods <laughs> in his own little bunker and never see anybody like, else. Yeah, it makes you sound like I hate people. I get it. I get it. <laughs> No, it's not that. It's just mo and mo sometimes, not most of the time, but and then sometimes there's like players who want to take over the game too, and I, I just don't. If you're not playing a cooperative game, you don't have to worry about that. So I live and die as a competitive game player. That's how I want to roll. But again, you just said that your Euro games you want to play basically competitive solitaire. Okay, so again, yeah, that means playing by yourself. <laughs> like, what's the point of playing with other people? You could just play against like an Adama that you're just trying to hit a points goal. It's the same That's thing. That's too much maintenance. It's too much oh maintenance. Oh my god! When there's other people there, they can move around their own pieces, and I don't have to bother. Get with you a Roomba it. that'll move the pieces around, and then there you go. You don't need anybody else. <laughs> That's true. I will have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, this that does make me sound like a real curmudgeon. So because <laughs> uh, you are a real curmudgeon. <laughs> Let me tell you, people, one of the biggest <laughs> burdens in my life is being like a super extrovert <laughs> married to a curmudgeon like Jason who never wants to see people, who never wants to interact, not even in a board game. I mean, honestly, it's like I live in a tower somewhere. What, are you going to let down your hair and I'm going to have to climb up? Is that what you're talking about? No, because you're already in the tower because you're not going to leave. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I have to let down my hair to try Rapunzel. to escape. I would be Rapunzel in this scenario. No, no. I'm Rapunzel. I want to go out and see the world. Your mother Gothel in this scenario, keeping me in the tower <laughs> and everybody else out. Yeah, I guess that's true. So, yeah, my last one, cooperative games. Um, my last one is a pretty easy guess and definitely the most shallow of all of my um, gaming turnoffs. But that's okay. Because it really is the opposite of my gaming turn on, which is cooperative games. No, I like cooperative games. My gaming turn on is I love beautiful, vibrant artwork. So one of my biggest gaming turn offs is dull colors and really hideous artwork. So every game I like. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, I could be won over, obviously, because in looking at a lot of the games that are in my top 10, top 25, they are hideously <laughs> done. I mean, in the artwork department. Like, that's true. Shakespeare, that's true. man. I love that game. That artwork is pretty. It's pretty drab. Pathetic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, like, for example, everyone raves about Scythe. And I just see that sitting on the shelf. I'm like, gosh, that looks like oatmeal like it's so ugh. like it's just i don't ugh. and even a lot of the games that i do really love now when i first saw them i was like are you freaking kidding me the game looks like so boring so dull why would i waste my time playing that 
And I, I frequently think this because I really awesome. That's why. love pretty beautiful artwork. But just like in real life, I am willing to give an ugly game a chance. And I may love it for what's inside. Wait a minute. I don't think I like this metaphor. No, I'm not talking about you. Why did you? You, you made it about you. I did because it felt very pointed. No, I meant about people in general. Remember, you had two of my three basic turn ons when we first met. You play That's guitar true. and you had long hair. I was really into that. Now I just play guitar and I have no long hair. You don't. And but that's okay. I don't want to leave the house. So I've like gotten like <laughs> negative three now. Sorry, you're stuck with me for life. Too late. But I, yeah, I, I, and I know it. I know it's not the best way to judge a game. I totally get that. And I am. I will walk into a game store and go, ooh, that looks neat, like I said last week. And then Jason will go, ooh, that game's not going to be good. And I'll pick it up and I'll be like, oh, no, it's it's um, area control or, oh, that. I thought that was like a fantasy theme, but it's actually space. Forget it. And I will get dis- I will f- get dissuaded from the beautiful artwork and realize that it's not a game I would like. And I've been trying to do better at saying, okay, this doesn't look like a game I I – would enjoy it's so ugly but let me see what kind of mechanics are involved so i'll give that a go and if it has some mechanics i like or some um you know designers that i trust i will consider it a little bit more to be honest um i think (laughs) our new hotness game buddy he brings over games that i automatically hate on site all the time (laughs) Like, honestly, and I I really try to school my face about it. And I haven't said anything because he's the one that will bust me up about it if I say it out loud. But every time he pulls out a game, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that game looks awful. Why? Why is he making us learn this game? Like every time. And then there are plenty of them that I actually really enjoy. And I surprise myself. I'm like, oh, I actually do like this game. It's not that bad. Like, this is pretty fun. And I. So I've I've tried to be better about not hastily judging games, but I can't deny that much like seeing a man in sweatpants in public, instant turn off if it has dull colors and ugly artwork. Oh, it makes me like it even more. I see it on the shelf. I'm like, oh yeah, grays and tans. That's my game right there. <laughs> Gross. Terrible Photoshop cards. It's got Marty Wallace's name on the back. I'm in all day. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, I like London. Dravis, hideous, slicking game ever. And I really, really, really love that game because it has mechanics. Well, our I version love. is ugly. Oh, I guess our that's true. Ugly. But how do you make a game like about Industrial Revolution, like age London, look good? Like, it pretty <laughs> much was a pretty bleak looking time in general. Uh, yeah, yeah. The second edition is pretty, but it's still a bleak theme, yeah. So, yeah, that's my three. Themes I hate, mechanics I hate, and dull colors and ugly artwork. My major turnoffs in games. Mine are roll to resolve combat or combat in general, interactivity player screwage, coin bro looking at you, Start. and cooperative games because I'm a curmudgeon I like to play by myself. <laughs> All right. So what about you? What automatically turns you off in a game? Now, I don't mean that. You'll eventually, maybe you'll be proved wrong. And that's what's great. And maybe we'll talk about games that have been, have like based on what I initially thought that proved us wrong. Um, but you can't help it. You just are automatically attracted to a game or it turns you off. So let us know. Give us um, a message right on our Facebook wall. Join the Riveted Facebook group. Hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, Messenger, whatever. Let us know what games, what things about games just turn you off, whether it's logical or not. Yep. (laughs) All right. I guess that's all we've got in us tonight. (laughs) I didn't have anything to say after that. (laughs) All right. As always, I've been Katie. And I'm Jason. And keep gaming, everybody. Keep gaming.